Todd Shelnett here back with CFI Pro Courses and this week we're looking at two of the final regulation chapters and if we go to the eCFRs well, this discussion where this discussion will actually take place we can see here that we're looking at again just as a review title 14 chapter 1 sub chapter D part 61 and of part 61 we're looking at the subparts and of the subparts that we're looking at, we're going to be looking specifically at subpart, you guessed it, Foxtrot. All right, so we're here at subpart F, Foxtrot, and that is commercially rated pilots. Just like we talk about with recreational and with private pilots, you have the same information, applicability, eligibility, aeronautical experience, flight proficiency, aeronautical experience, and then the exception to the night flying requirements and commercial pilot privileges and limitations. The one thing's a little bit different on this is the um, uh, the uh, limitations to flying on small islands thing that we have with the private that that is not in this one. So, but let's look at subpart F and see what it has to offer. Let's make sure we have our screen good size there. All right, let's start from the top here and go to subpart F, commercially rated pilots. And it says that if you, who does this apply to? So basically we're trying to read the reg. How do we read the reg? We have to read everything because we have no idea what it's pointing at. So unless we read everything, we won't understand what it's trying to tell us. So subpart F and is specifically dealing with, uh, this subpart prescribes the requirements for the issuance of a commercial pilot certificate in rating, the conditions under which those certificates and ratings are necessary, and the general operating rules for persons who hold those certificates and ratings. All right, so three things here that we're looking at, the requirements for the issuance, the conditions under which those certificates and ratings are necessary, and the general operating rules for persons who hold those certificates and ratings. So we'll talk about that as we go down through. So 61.23 is literally almost, well, not literally, but almost a mirror image of what you would find in 61.103, but just a slight couple of difference in wordings. But it says to be eligible for a commercially rated pilot, a person must be at least 18 years of age. <clears throat> I think one of the biggest things that people ask uh, from me is, can a person start training to be a commercial pilot prior to 18 years of age? And that is, yes, absolutely. A person can start training to be a pilot at any age. As long as you can safely fly the airplane or sit in a ground school, you can train at any age. But in order for you to be eligible, in order for you to be eligible for a commercial pilot certificate, a person must be at least 18 years of age. Read, speak, write, and understand the English language. We've talked about this before in the other ones. You know how to do that already. Receive a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor who conducted the ground training or the person's home study. We already looked at that in Advisory Circular 6165, the home study course. And certify that the person is prepared for the required knowledge test that applies to the aircraft category and class rating sought. So for this particular one, we're looking at the aircraft category is airplane and the class is going to be single engine. And that is the endorsement that we'll write for that because it says receive a log book endorsement who did from the authorized instructor who did this. If you look in your advisory circular, this will be your alpha 34 endorsement, alpha 34 endorsement. Let's go on to D. It says pass the required knowledge test. With the Alpha 34 endorsement, will allow you to take that knowledge test, okay? And you're going to be tested on the aeronautical knowledge areas listed in 61125, which we have not got to yet. It's down below. Receive the required training and a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor who conducted the training on the areas of operation listed in 127. We haven't got there yet. It's down below, but it's very small. Remember, only one paragraph in 127 applies to you, and only one paragraph in 129 apply to you. Of this part, that apply to the aircraft category and class rating sought. In this particular case here, we're talking about airplane and either single or multi-engine land. Uh, as well as certify that the person is prepared for the required practical test. And how do you do that? Well, uh, you're going to do it on the Alpha 35 endorsement. So it says, 
receive the required training and a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor who conducted the training in 61127 and certified that the person is prepared. So the endorsement probably has something has to have something about 127 in it, and it does. If you look at the Alpha 35 endorsement, it definitely does. Paragraph F says, meet the aeronautical experience requirements of the subpart that apply to the aircraft category and class rating SALT before applying for the practical test. What does this mean? Before applying for the practical test. So the date that you actually apply or go to the check ride or fill out your application, you must have met the time requirement prior to filling out the application. Meaning that you cannot do anything with the time to make it go over or meet the requirements it has to be legit time of what you were training for, okay? And letter G says pass the required practical test on the errors of operation listed in 127 that apply to it. But how can you do that? You can't go take the test unless you have the proper endorsement. And that's your 6139 A6I and double I endorsement. Number one, your Alpha 1 endorsement. Why, are they, why is it Alpha 1? Well, it's required for any single practical test that you're going to take. You've got to have the Alpha 1 if there's an airplane involved. In order for you to do this commercial pilot exam, you must hold at least a private pilot certificate under this part or meet the requirements of 6173 and comply with the sections of this part that apply to the aircraft category and class rating sought. Okay, so if that is you, then that is it. So 6173, does anybody know what 6173 is? Well, 61.73 is what we commonly refer to as a mil comp or military competency. So someone can actually go and do this as long as they have some type of military competency exam performed or some type of military experience that would be under 6173 eligible for them to be able to say yes that's equivalent to a civilian certificate and that's what 6173 means moving on to aeronautical knowledge we can see here that if for a person who applies for a commercial pilot certificate must receive and log ground training don't forget to log the ground training for your student or Complete a home study course, we've already talked about that, on the aeronautical knowledge areas of paragraph B of this section. So what are we looking at that's different from here in the private pilot? Not a lot, not a lot. That's what kind of blows a lot of examiners away when a student comes to a CFI check ride and they don't know certain things. And I'm like, wow, you're an accelerated course. You just did a check ride on private pilot. You had to know every bit of this stuff here. You just did a check ride on instrument. You just did a check ride on commercial. Why is it that you don't know about these things that you're being tested on? It just kind of blows the examiner's mind how someone could go through an accelerated program in a couple of months and not know any of this information or basically be weak on it and like you had to prepare for a minimum of two practical tests and on one of your practical tests practical tests you had even more situational uh, training on one or multiple of these items here uh, so even though you're dealing with like meteorology you had to know for private and commercial but w you should be the uh, the uh, the epitome of, of weather understanding when it comes to instrument. So these things, if you're going to go to this check ride and you don't know this list, it would be a good idea to not go to the CFI check ride until you know this list as well. Okay. Uh, but definitely you don't want to send your student to a commercial check ride unless you've talked about these things. So again, they're all the same as a private pilot, except for there's a couple of different ones here and are very easy to spot uh, all the same here but if you look down here we have these new uh, words that we're going to say here which is basically here high altitude operations so literally the same as that is in the private except for high altitude operations is the main difference and we have to talk about not only high altitude operations in regards to performance and everything else, but also meteorology and how uh, high altitude weather, looking at high altitude charts 
and reports and forecast. Those are all very important things to know as a commercial pilot. And of course, that is it in regards to the ground training. Now we're getting into the flight proficiency. And as you can see, it is just a direct cut of the commercial ACS. It's exactly what's in the ACS. It says a person who applies for a commercial pilot certificate must receive and log ground and flight training from an authorized instructor. On the areas of operation of this section that apply to the aircraft category and class rating sought, meaning that if you want to be a commercial pilot, you have to be trained in the specific category and class. So don't let anyone tell you that you can use this 61127 time in which you did it in a single engine for multi-engine that is not correct or something that you did in a helicopter will transfer over to single engine absolutely not that is the most absurd bull crap i've ever heard in my life if you read the regs it's so incredibly clear what you're you're probably asking yourself todd why are you getting all worked up about this I'm getting myself worked up about it because I have too many DPEs question me about this and they absolutely don't know their rear end from the hole in the ground because they haven't read the regulations. So please don't let anybody tell you that because it says it literally right there in black and white, folks. Uh, so let's look at B here. Air of Operation 1, and that is for single engine. Air of Operation B2 would be for multi-engine. So what do we have to talk about? Well, like I said, it's a mirror image of the ACS. Pre-flight preparation, pre-flight procedures, airport and seaplane base operations, takeoff, landings and go-arounds, performance maneuvers, ground reference maneuvers, navigation, slow flights and stalls, emergency operations, high altitude operations, and post-flight procedures. That's it. So it's just only those particular 11 items that must be gone through, and that is a mirror image of the ACS. If you're doing a multi-engine, then you've got to do these things to make sure you understand those things. All right, and that is literally all of 61127. That means anything to us because everything, every, that's uh, so number two here is for multi-engine and of course uh, three is for rotorcraft and so on and so on and so on. So we can scroll, 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 scroll all the way down to the next one. And now we're at 61129 aeronautical experience. And what we see here is for an airplane single engine rating, except as provided in paragraph I of this section. Well, paragraph I is the simulator uh, caveat to this, which is stating that you can have 50 hours of simulator to go towards these numbers that we're about to talk about. A person who applies for a commercial pilot certificate with an airplane category and single engine class rating must log at least 250 hours of flight time as a pilot that consists of at least the following. 100 hours in a powered aircraft, of which 50 hours must be in airplanes. 100 hours of pilot and command time, which include at least 50 hours in airplanes, 50 hours of cross country, of which 10 must be in airplanes, and that's it in that. And then we're going to get on to the dual. So that's one uh, alpha, one, two, and we're going to get on three. Remember, this is only for single engine, single engine, okay? We're going to come back in a scenario and talk about these times again. So don't fret if it seems somewhat complicated. Trust me, it is not. You just have to have a way to memorize it. Letter, uh, <laughs> not letter, but number three says 20 hours of training on the areas of operation listed in 127 Bravo 1 of this part. Hmm, interesting. 20 hours of training on the areas of operation listed in 61127 Bravo 1. Remember me talking about that where I said you, you have to have that training of that. Well, there it is. It says again right there. And if we go back up there, it says in a single engine airplane. All right. So of this part that include at least this. So 20 hours of training and that means with an instructor. So the definition of training is with an instructor. And so 3i says you got to have 10 hours of instrument training. And this is the real instrument training. This is not uh, the the stuff that we do during the private pilot uh, where where you don't have to uh, study actual instrument stuff. 
you're basically just trying to beat your way out of a wet paper bag. This is legit instrument stuff here. So 10 hours of instrument training using a view limiting device, including attitude instrument flying, partial panel skills, recovery from unusual flight attitudes, and in intercepting and tracking navigational systems. And if a person is coming over to you from, like, let's say, helicopter, well, that's okay because they can actually uh, be have a reduced amount because five hours of the 10 hours required on instrument training must be in a single engine airplane. Okay, so that must be in a single engine airplane. So if you've done 10 hours in a multi-engine airplane, it would not count except for five hours of that. So you couldn't do the whole 10 hours in a multi. You would have to do at least five in a single engine airplane. You also must have 10 hours of training in either a complex airplane, a turbine powered airplane, or a technically advanced airplane. Now, for those of you who are joining me who are commercially rated pilots and are working towards their CFI and don't specifically know about this wording here, this is actually a change that was made in November of 2018 and this TAA, which actually you can see right there, the TAA exception was brought in to replace the complex, the need for a single engine complex airplane, which are getting increasingly more rare nowadays. And the FAA recognized it and they actually made a good decision by allowing us to use these TAA airplanes to be able to meet that requirement. Now, if you don't know what a TAA is, you can just go look that up. Uh, that will be something for another video. But uh, that airplane must meet the requirements of paragraph J of this section or any combination thereof, meaning that you could have four hours in a complex and two hours in a turbine and four hours in a TAA, and that would cover your 10 hours. Uh, the airplane must be appropriate to land or sea for the rating sought. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the 10 hours of training in a complex airplane must be appropriate to either land or sea for the rating sought. So if you're going to go to commercial airplane single engine land, well, it has to be 10 hours of training in a complex airplane or turbine powered or TAA that is conducive to a land plane, not one on floats. Okay. Now, You'll also need, of that 20 hours, one two-hour cross-country flight in a single-engine airplane in daytime conditions that consist of a total straight-line distance of more than 100 nautical miles from the original point of departure. And this is your daytime, and this is your night, nighttime. Daytime, nighttime. Okay. And so when I get to these, I just say 1 to 100 day, 1 to 100 night. 1 to 100 day and one to 100 night one to 100 day one to 100 night and you got to have those cross countries and again that must be dual and then lastly paragraph v says three hours in a single engine airplane with an authorized instructor in preparation for the practical test within the preceding two calendar months from the month of the test which means it could give you up to around 92 days so hopefully it wouldn't be that long or at least if it had been Let's hope that you've actually done some training with your student prior to the, allowing them to go to the check ride. Now, paragraph four is going to switch us over to the solo time. And paragraph four says 10 hours of solo flight time in a single engine airplane or 10 hours of flight time performing the duties of pilot in command in a single engine airplane with an authorized instructor on board, either of which may be credited towards the flight time requirement under paragraph A2 of this section on the areas of operation listed under 61.127 Bravo 1 that include the following. But we absolutely have to take a look at this because this is probably one of the, the most misunderstood things probably in the flight training regime. Very controversial, but there is letters of interpretation out there that do explain this very well. 
And uh, it says that you got to have 10 hours of solo flight time on a single engine or 10 hours of flight time performing the duties of pilot command in a single engine airplane with an instructor on board. But how is that solo? Well, the FAA is very familiar with this thing called insurance requirements. And they know that sometimes an insurance company will not allow someone to operate an aircraft solo if they don't if they're not qu properly qualified, okay, if they don't meet the requirements to fly the airplane as PIC. Now, this is more commonly seen when you go from single to multi and not really from anything to single. But imagine if you had a helicopter pilot and he wants to come and do his single engine commercial. So he's a rotorcraft private pilot, but he wants to come to you and do his single engine airplane commercial. Can you do that? Absolutely. He's already got a lot of flight time, probably. He's got some. We know at least he has 40 hours because he completed his private pilot. So we just need to get him the rest of his flight time in a single engine airplane and go from there. Okay. So in this particular case, what if the insurance company said, absolutely not. We will not allow this rotor guy, rotor, rotor head to operate this airplane he's not rated to fly single engine airplane not going to do it or what if you simply just wanted to milk your what if you simply just wanted to milk your client for another 10 hours of of flight training well you can't flight train with them on this ride but you could ride with them for 10 hours if you're building flight time you don't want to miss out of 10 hours if you're trying to get to your 1500 so this is has more than one way that you can take advantage of this 10 hours okay but in essence it's designed the FAA wrote this in because they know that sometimes the insurance companies will not allow the person flying it to be able to do that 10 hours of solo when they're not ready to fly the airplane so it says either of which may be credited towards the flight time requirement under paragraph a2 let's scroll back up to a2 just one second so here's a here's two and it says that that time can be credited towards your 100 hours of pilot in command flight time. Okay, so you can put that non solo time towards your pilot in command time. What does that mean? Well, that means if you were solo in the airplane, well, that's legit pilot in command. But this says 10 hours of solo flight time. And of that 10 hours of 10 hours of solo flight time, if you have an authorized instructor on board, is that solo? No, it's not solo. But the FAA, like I said, they realize what the problem is here. So what do they do? They say, look, you can actually have an instructor ride on board who's just going to be there to make sure you don't kill yourself and do anything stupid. And as long as that instructor doesn't speak or say anything or and just sits there and just watches, you can take that flight time and you can actually credit that pilot in command solo time towards paragraph A2, even though it wasn't actually solo and wasn't actually pilot in command time per the definitions in 61.3 and 61.51 because it's counter of the definitions of that. Okay. So that's what that means. If you're having issues with it, please post your comments down below. Be glad to have another conversation with you about that through the notes. In addition to your solo time, you've got to have one hour. Uh, in addition to with your 10 hours of solo flight time, you must also have one cross-country flight of not less than 300 nautical mile total distance with landings at a minimum of three points. One of which is a straight line distance of at least 250 nautical miles from the original departure point. So from the original departure point, one of your stops must be at least, or the first stop must be at least 250 nautical miles. It can actually be the first stop or the last stop. It doesn't really matter, but it's got to be one or the other. It's got to be greater than 200. One leg has got to be at least 250 from the original departure point. However, if you are in Hawaii, the longest segment need only have a straight line distance of at least 150 nautical miles if you're in Hawaii. 
And lastly, five hours in night VFR conditions with 10 takeoff and landings, with each landing involving a flight in the traffic pattern at an airport with an operating control tower, meaning that you simply just couldn't go from airport to airport and log the landings doing straight ins and then a touch and go and going right out. You couldn't do that. You would actually have to have it in the pattern at an airport with an operating control tower. And that takes care of the time requirement. We're almost finished here. Let's wrap it up with uh, these last ones here. I'm going to scroll on down because these are all the different categories and they don't apply to us. There's a rotorcraft and uh, all the other stuff here that we have. So we don't have to worry about any of that. Let's get into the night flying requirement. This is literally a mirror image of the one that we had in 61 uh, in uh, the private pilot regs. And it's all it's saying is that uh, if you are in Alaska and you receive your private, your commercial pilot certificate without doing your nighttime stuff, you could get a commercial pilot certificate, but on the back, it's going to have night flying prohibited. And remember that that certificate is only going to be good for 12 calendar month period after the day of issuance. And then you turn into a pumpkin. Okay. Here's an easy one for you, and let's wrap it up with this. Commercial pilot privileges and limitations. You've waited such a long time to get it. You finally get your commercial pilot certificate. What can you do? Well, it says that a person who holds a commercial pilot certificate may act as pilot in command of an aircraft, carrying passengers or property, that's right, for compensation or hire. Provided that the person is qualified in accordance with this part and with the applicable parts of this chapter, chapter that apply to the operation. So that does not mean that you can just, because you have a commercial pilot certificate, you can just jump in and do whatever you want to do. It has to be appropriate to the operation in which you are conducting as a commercial pilot. And there are a few of them. So make sure that you don't screw that up. And let's see, Alpha II says that you may also, a person who holds a commercial pilot certificate, may act as pilot in command of an aircraft for compensation or hire, provided that the person is qualified in accordance with this part and with the applicable parts of this chapter that apply to, that's right, the operation. And we don't know what that operation is until we actually go and get the job and figure out what the operation is, and that's it. Now, those are your two privileges. What about your limitations? Okay, number two does not apply to us because that's lighter than air. And we'll scroll on down past two. And that's it with that. And then we have paragraph B, which is limitations. Now, a person who applies for a commercial pilot certificate with an airplane category or powered lift category rating and does not hold an instrument rating in the same category and class will be issued a commercial pilot certificate that contains a limitation on the back. The carriage of persons for hire in airplanes or power lift on cross-country flights in the excess of 50 nautical miles or at night is prohibited. And that is going to be your limitation for the commercial pilot. Could you have more limitations? Yes, you actually could have more limitations depend on the type of operation that you are going to be doing. But this is one clearly written on the back of the pilot certificate. And how do you get that released? Well, you simply just meet the requirements of FAR 6165, not advisory circular 6165. Okay, don't get that confused. This is FAR 6165, and that is the instrument rating. All right. So uh, the rest of this stuff here doesn't apply because it says for balloon and uh, balloons and none of this stuff down here applies to you. So now all you got to do is get that experience and then show your stuff to an examiner and they can do it. It's an administrative check ride, a little bit longer than expected here, but hopefully you got some good uh, tips today in regards to this. Um, we will not be going over airline transport pilot stuff uh, because it's self-endorsed and uh, everything with that. So we really don't care about that. But when we come back on our next video, what we're specifically going to be talking about is all the good juicy information. And I am just scrolling like a madman here. All the great information in this sub part. So flight instructors, other than flight instructors with a sport pilot rating. I'm Todd Shellnut with CFI Pro Courses. Bye bye.